questions will come up. Hello, hello. Right. Kia ora. Kia ora koto katoa. Uh, my name's George Thompson. I'm chairing the session today. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Nick Wilson, famous uh, across the department, <laughs> and New Zealand, uh, who, um, this is, today is not the first. Uh, he has been researching violence and health for over 40 years and publishing large amounts for at least 15 years. Uh, but I'm looking forward to his synthesis of uh, the material around World War I, other wars, um, and I hand over uh, to Nick. Uh, please uh, leave the questions, if possible, uh, till afterwards. Um, we can have them then. Thanks, George, and kia ora koutou. And uh, yeah, it's, um, this is a bit of a team effort, actually. As you can see, there's uh, a range of co-authors that have helped with uh, various parts of this work. So yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, three different wars and the impact on the New Zealand military and their health, and particularly taking a prevention focus and seeing how uh, this burden could have been prevented. So uh, the first part is on the South African War, the Boer War. Second is on the uh, uh, First World War, Second World War, and then uh, a part four where I'm going to look at uh, veteran lifespan impacts uh, over those um, three wars. So why research the health impacts of uh, war? Well, uh, unfortunately, the world has persisting conflicts and even the risks may be increasing in, in some regions. Uh, veterans' health is an ongoing issue uh, in, in many countries, including New Zealand. Uh, and actually, it seems like there's diversity in the type of um, post-combat syndromes uh, with different war-specific features in terms of the long-term, uh, uh, particularly the mental health impacts of uh, different wars. And really, I guess an underlying theme is that it's important to uh, learn from history so we're not uh, uh, condemned to repeat it. So just putting uh, these wars in context with other big disasters uh, and the death toll from the South African war is pretty small so it's not included there. But these wars you can see have a way bigger impact than all of New Zealand's uh, sudden mass fatality events uh, that we tend to hear more about. Uh, bigger than the New Zealand wars, bigger than the influenza pandemic, uh, but less than uh, the best estimate for the musket wars, uh, which had a, a massive impact on um, uh, uh, Maori health. So looking first at the health impacts of the South African war on New Zealand uh, military personnel, and in, in some work we've just done recently, we identified that the total uh, number of deaths for, for that war was actually uh, greater, uh, another 10 additional uh, deaths um, pushing up the total to that amount. And that was because uh, the New Zealand military authorities stopped counting pretty soon after the end of the conflict. And yet people kept dying from their wounds in the subsequent uh, few years. 
Uh, and most of the deaths were from disease, which was pretty typical of wars up to that period. But that is the last war in which disease dominated for the wars New Zealand's been involved in. So it's 60% of all the deaths, uh, rather than from conflict. And there were uh, accidental deaths as well. And the official record just says that there was only 2.7% uh, wounded. But when we did our uh, random sampling of the military files, which were all online, uh, we got a much higher figure of 39% uh, uh, of the uh, personnel involved having some type of injury or illness. Uh, and that's usually at the level to, to require hospitalization because uh, the military didn't record minor injuries in the, uh, in the records. And actually, uh, horse-related injur injuries were higher than war-related injuries for the, for the wounding uh, category. Uh, people being falling, falling off horses, being kicked by horses, bitten by horses. Uh, so there was a range of things. And even in, because it, uh, there's a lot of lightning strikes in South Africa, there were also men uh, sometimes very severely injured by uh, being hit by lightning. So if you take the course of the war uh, across these years, uh, you can see that the uh, disease burden dominated nearly every month of the war except for a few freak things that happened in 1902, where there was a big battle which killed a lot of uh, men. Uh, there was a, a large train crash that killed um, uh, 15 New Zealand men. And then, after the war ended, around here, there were ongoing outbreaks. And there was a big measles outbreak on a troop ship returning to New Zealand. Uh, and in those days, uh, measles had a, a pretty high case fatality risk. So uh, there were deaths from uh, measles as well. So uh, yeah, that category is killed in action or died of wounds. Um, so you can see that the actual war uh, in terms of the fighting was small in, compared to this ongoing burden of uh, uh, disease. But it's important to also remember the impact on civilians and uh, uh, just to highlight that in this war, it was the start of the use of concentration camps by the uh, British authorities. And uh, those concentration camps killed between 18,000 and uh, 28,000 uh, Boer women, uh, men and uh, children uh, from disease and starvation. And there were also many Africans who were uh, caught up in the conflict um, uh, dying. Uh, and tragically, you know, New Zealand uh, military personnel committed uh, a range of war crimes. They burnt Boer property, killed livestock, and looted as well, all of which were against the uh, Geneva Convention, and there was uh, virtually no uh, discipline meted out for these uh, activities. And, and it's just come up recently, uh, all the um, Boer Bibles that were looted from people's homes and brought back to New Zealand uh, over the following decades, some of them were returned, uh, but uh, a historian still thinks there are looted Boer Bibles, sometimes with the, you know, the family tree written in the, uh, in the front of the Bible. So these were very valuable uh, heirlooms, which um, uh, New, Zealand, uh, New Zealand military personnel like to uh, uh, bring home. So now looking at this particular war, what was the uh, preventable components? Well, I mean, the, the war was a pretty dubious uh, uh, adventure from the start. It was a mixture of various British imperial forces uh, wanting to control South Africa. Uh, but there were big commercial forces as well uh, in terms of who controlled the diamond mines, which were uh, starting to uh, uh, produce a lot of wealth uh, at that time. So New Zealand just got caught up in this uh, activity without really thinking about um, uh, the purpose of it all. And it was very poorly... Uh, uh, strategically understood this particular war. The military really had no idea of what the capacity of the uh, uh, Boer weaponry was, which was actually state-of-the-art um, compared to uh, antiquated New Zealand uh, rifles. And the Boer tactics were uh, very sophisticated guerrilla-style warfare, uh, while the, the uh, British Commonwealth troops uh, persisted in the frontal charges that they had learnt in their training uh, and, and, uh, and they persisted with those basically 
uh, th throughout most of the war. And it meant that they, they'd just charge in and the Boers would uh, shoot them and uh, there'd be massive uh, casualties. There was inadequate training, sometimes just a few weeks before they took off from New Zealand. And um, in fact, some contingents were called uh, the Rough Riders because they had virtually uh, no training. Uh, there were poorly equipped, outdated rifles, uh, small horses, and New Zealand men were partly selected on their height to begin with. So the ratio of uh, tall men and small horses was uh, particularly problematic. And um, uh, you know, the horses were exhausted, overworked, and uh, underfed. There were often no tents, so they just slept out in the cold and the rain under their coats. And you can see them here. Uh, um, sleeping out on the veldt. So the veldt was very hot during the day and extremely cold at night. So uh, they'd, they'd suffer both those um, uh, temperature extremes. So they also had very ragged um, clothing because it was not replaced. And there were there bizarre incidences near the end of the war where the Boers were even uh, suffering worse clothing conditions. So when they uh, captured um, Commonwealth troops, they'd get them to strip off all their clothes, including their underwear, take the lot and leave them naked. Um, so, <laughs> because they couldn't take prisoners, it was just easier just to uh, take all their food and their equipment and their clothes. Um, so <laughs> that made, made it even worse for them. There were food shortages. Uh, there were, basically, they had um, hard biscuits, bully beef, uh, sugar and tea, shortages of soap, so uh, they nearly all suffered from uh, lice infestation, uh, shortages of ambulance wagons. So there were often days while, uh, for wounded men to be taken from the battlefield to uh, the nearest field hospital. And when, you, when they got to the field hospital, they were often uh, appallingly equipped, uh, often lacking even basics like water. So if, you, if you're lacking water, you can't even have the, uh, much hope of good hygiene. So uh, other problems, crowded troop ships with um, outbreaks of measles and also pneumonia. Now that did cause a public outcry in New Zealand and there was an inquiry which um, basically did identify poor ventilation as a problem, but really downplayed the uh, crowding issue and said this was just uh, you know, standard practice. And after the war, there was no uh, review of what had happened in terms of all those deaths from um, uh, disease uh, and other preventable uh, deaths. And after the war, the focus was on the, uh, the great heroic activities of New Zealand soldiers and uh, building uh, hundreds of memorials around the country. So there was no thoughtful consideration of the health issues. In fact, uh, a lot of trouble was gone to memorialize Kitchener, who was the guy who set up the concentration camps that killed thousands of Boer women and children. Uh, so yeah, streets were named after him. There was one statue put up in Auckland, but someone took it with an ax for some reason and uh, uh, completely destroyed it and it was not rebuilt. But uh, the statue in Invercargill remains, though there was a, a, a tack, someone covered it with nuggets. So, so obviously Kitchener did irritate some people, uh, but you know, basically he's still in this sort of uh, heroic form, even though you know you could say he's a, uh, without doubt a war criminal in terms of uh, harming w women and children. Okay, so that's um, that's the first part on the South African War. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the um, health impacts of uh, the First World War. And uh, this photo is of the troops at um, New Zealand troops at Passchendaele, and you can really see the you know, atrocious conditions of the. Uh, the mud, which was a major feature uh, of that part of the war. So in terms of the uh, mortality impact, uh, it was pretty high in all, all years, a total of around um, uh, 16,000 deaths uh, actually during the war and thousands of deaths after, um, with the biggest battles occurring in uh, 1917. So in contrast to South Africa, you can see injury dominated and disease was a uh, a smaller uh, component. And in terms of the uh, time course, it was very spiky with 
uh, these particular battles, uh, Gallipoli, the Somme, uh, and, but the worst of all uh, was Passchendaele. And Passchendaele had these, uh, you know, the, the worst death tolls of, in probably in New Zealand history for New Zealanders. Uh, for example, there, 800 men killed in one morning uh, all, all as part of the New Zealand uh, troops. And then they d tend to die of wounds over subsequent uh, uh, weeks. And in terms of um, disease, that was uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, e every year there was a disease burden, but um, the pandemic influenza capturing the uh, last bit of the war uh, contributed to that um, particular toll in 1918. And there was also uh, problems with uh, death from pneumonia uh, and when we analyse the uh, seasonality of that, uh, the, there were peaks in the uh, disease deaths in winter months for, for the New Zealand troops uh, when you excluded the uh, pandemic period. So actually, um, yeah, some very, very cold winters uh, during part of the war. So when we did a random sampling of the disease deaths, you can see the span driven um, largely by pneumonia and bronchitis. This is an, all in a non-pandemic year. Uh, but you know, conditions like tuberculosis, uh, dysentery and typhoid, which would be related to the crowding conditions, so would meningitis. So looking at the preventability aspects of uh, the uh, health problems for the troops. So uh, one part of it was um, uh, the high disease burden at Gallipoli. So this was a, um, a military disaster strategically, just like Passchendaele was. It was very poorly conceived and um, uh, uh, you know, a complete failure from a military point of view. But also the troops had very poor food and um, uh, uh, poor water supplies. That contributed to poor hygiene. And so there were uh, major disease outbreaks and insufficient medical services. So that's one of that's from Peter, one of Peter Jackson's uh, creations. The flies crawling over some of this um, uh, bully beef, which was uh, the standard uh, ration. And there's an interesting story that the troops really in the trenches at Gallipoli got absolutely sick of eating this stuff, so they'd occasionally hurl uh, a can over into the Turkish uh, trenches, which were only uh, you know tens of meters away. And on one occasion, it, it, it got hurled back with a note, actually in, in English, saying, bully beef, no, cigarettes, yes. <laughs> so uh, the Turks were obviously sick of the um, bully beef as well. And we actually analyzed the, um, uh, the nutritional composition of the Gallipoli rations, uh, and they were severely deficient in vitamin C, vitamin A, and vitamin E. And although New Zealand, uh, New Zealand's um, at that time in Hawke's Bay was producing all this canned fruit and canned veggies, none of them ever got anywhere near Gallipoli. And if they had had a small uh, proportion of uh, canned fruit and veggies, they would have got all, the, all these particular nutrients. So, uh, I mean, the military knew that uh, scurvy was a problem at the time, but, um, uh, and they knew that uh, fruit and veggies would prevent it, but they, uh, they thought it was going to be a quick campaign, so they just kept them on the uh, biscuits and the um, canned meat. And as a result, uh, they, some of them actually did get scurvy uh, um, near the end of the Gallipoli campaign. So in terms of preventability, there was really this uh, massive strategic mil military mistake by General Haig, who ignored all his commanders, saying the uh, weather is disastrous, we can't go ahead. We can't pull up the artillery to protect the troops. Uh, and so it was just a complete massacre as the troops uh, got stranded in all the mud and couldn't get over the barbed wire and the, and the German machine guns just uh, uh, massacred them. So it was, um, you know, and Hay got a lot of criticism for that, but you know, he just kept on with frontal assaults um, uh, for a bit, bit longer. And yeah, here's a, you know, even, even in um, uh, this particular battle in um, uh, 1917, troops were just getting out of the trenches and walking or running uh, into the uh, machine gun fire. So uh, 
there was very slow learning process by the military that um, just uh, walking up to a machine gun um, was a dumb idea. And in terms of preventability, there was also very slow uptake from these um, felt hats to uh, metal hats, uh, to steel um, helmets. Uh, and this design was still not as good as the German design, which protected the back of the neck. And um, uh, there were also problems with deficiencies in the uh, steel uh, use. So some weren't that effective. And then in terms of um, sexually transmitted infections, uh, it took about three years before, and thanks to Etty Rout, that um, uh, condoms were provided to the troops. And there was, you know, the, the health education was pretty primitive, just sort of fear-based to scare the men into um, uh, protecting themselves. But what's always intrigued me is how the troops would have interpreted this um, fine print on the pack for army use only. So, um, yeah, what they made of that, I just don't know. So um, other problems were the crowded um, military camps. There were disease outbreaks in, um, uh, uh, earlier in the war in Trentham, but it took a l quite a while for the tent camps to move to barracks. And even in um, 1918, they still had extensive tent use. And that was definitely problematic for uh, meningitis outbreaks. And also when the uh, pandemic um, in 1918, pandemic influenza hit. The troop ships were also very crowded, crowded and um, we've done some studies to show that that crowding was a factor in the uh, outbreaks of pandemic influenza. But despite all this disastrous uh, 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 health impacts, there were actually some, you know, war does trigger a lot of technological change and, um, you know, New Zealand, uh, uh, health workers were doing studies on broad spectrum vaccines and there was some evidence that they uh, they worked and there were big advances by New Zealanders in plastic surgery. Uh, but the war in general advanced uh, medical and surgical techniques like you know, the whole uh, process of blood transfusion arose out of World War I, psychiatry advanced as people learned about shell shock and public health in terms of protecting the people from uh, enteric diseases um, also advanced. And just, you know, one, one advance for the military was to go from horse-drawn uh, ambulances to actually motorised ambulances. Uh, it's a New Zealand one um, uh, in France. So, uh, you know, they did adopt uh, some more modern um, uh, techniques which would have reduced uh, morbidity. Okay, so um, moving on to World War II and health, and um, just to really highlight some of the things here, this war was not as burdensome as um, uh, World War I, so uh, around 12,000 deaths. But New Zealand's burden per uh, million population was actually higher than the UK and Australia. The air war had a um, particularly high fatality rate. Um, and there were tropical disease problems like malaria in some parts of the war. A big feature of this war was prisoner of war um, with 8,000 plus New Zealanders captured. Uh, there was a relatively high impact on Maori with the Maori battalion having high casualty rates. And there was civilian, you know, the whole economy was transformed into a war economy and uh, uh, that generated things like increased industrial accidents and, um, and so on. A feature of, the, uh, of this war was, yeah, the prisoners of war, especially in the Japanese prisoner of war camps where there were problems with starvation, nutrient deficiencies, and obviously uh, extreme stress. So they're all looking pretty, pretty slim uh, after uh, being in those, um, those camps. And you know, especially New Zealanders in the Solomon Islands, there were uh, risks with uh, uh, malaria, of course, and other uh, tropical diseases. So in this war, we, we, there were mo motorized ambulances and, um, and you know, surgery could be done even in the pre-antibiotic era. Uh, if there was good uh, aseptic technique, there was good outcomes from uh, uh, surgery. 
But this war also had a range of features in which, you know, are obviously preventable. Of avoiding poorly conceived campaigns. Again, um, you know, this is controversial, but most historians regard uh, the whole campaign in Crete as a, as a big disaster, uh, with uh, largely led again by uh, the British military uh, rulers. Um, and, you know, there were also areas where it could have been improved in terms of post-war support for veterans. Pensions were pretty meagre uh, initially, and um, you know, there, was, you know, there was some retraining employment opportunities and so on, but uh, still far from uh, ideal. Okay, so now the final section is to look at um, lifespan uh, impacts of war veterans. And so uh, what is known here is that um, most studies suggest that uh, there are these long-term adverse impacts on World War II veteran health and survival. Uh, particularly long-term uh, mental health aspects, and particularly for prisoners of war, and particularly those prisoners of war that were in Japanese prisoner of war camps as opposed to uh, Italian or German ones. But it is complex. Some studies don't actually show increased or cause uh, mortality for veterans, and that's because of two things. So first of all, there's a selection effect so that the, uh, the way the military recruit uh, soldiers tends, tends to select the healthier ones. So that's called the healthy soldier effect. And then once you're in the military, your chances of getting sent to the front line uh, might again depend on your health. Uh, so that maybe people with uh, uh, you know, poor vision and so on, they get uh, put on administrative duties or um, you know, uh, other non-frontline duties. So that's called the healthy warrior effect. So two selection effects at play. So for New Zealand, um, the, the best studied um, uh, veterans are the uh, World War II ones, but there's been no lifespan studies of them. Uh, but there are these morbidity studies and George Salmon uh, and Claire Salmon did this work in 1977, which showed the high level of morbidity in uh, both World War I and World War II veterans. And um, that work actually had policy impact changes. They actually, because of that work, they increased the pensions for war, war veterans. So that had a, uh, quite an important impact. Then there were psychiatric studies um, done showing the problems with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and uh, there's a few books and PhD theses where they interviewed World War II uh, veterans and uh, identified the high level of um, ongoing morbidity. And in fact, right after the war, there were 23,000 uh, personnel receiving pensions for uh, service-related disabilities. So you can see really a very large bur health burden um, from war-related injuries. So in terms of the lifespan studies we've done, uh, we've done One's looking at uh, South African War and World War I. And here we compare uh, the combat personnel with the non-combat uh, troops. So bypassing that selection effect into the military. And in both these cases, uh, our uh, non-exposed group the, were the ones that uh, they were on a ship traveling to South Africa when the when the war was about to end, actually, they, the war ended three days after they arrived. So uh, that was, you know, they were very disappointed. Um, <laughs> they, they sailed back to New Zealand. Uh, and in the case of the uh, World War I, the, tr the, the ships were en route and um, uh, some of them turned back and some of them went to uh, the UK. They did training and, and then participated in non-combat post-war activities and then returned. So that was the comparison there. And uh, for World War II, because we've had trouble getting access to the, uh, uh, the files, but that's starting to become available. Uh, we use symmetry data from uh, Titer Symmetry and then match that to a, a synthetic control cohort of New Zealand men born in the same year and being alive at um, uh, the same time as the uh, uh, year after the war using Statistics New Zealand life tables. So the results, um, so actually no difference st significantly for the 
South African war, combat, non-combat. And when we, that's a comparison with uh, New Zealand men, again, using statistics, New Zealand uh, uh, life table data. But for World War I, yes, there was this um, uh, gap of a, a couple of years and, uh, and also a gap of uh, around five years for the, uh, the, the, the veterans uh, for World War II versus um, uh, the synthetic cohort of New Zealand men we used. There's differences between these wars though. You know, they had different lengths of combat exposure. You know, some wars had um, uh, uh, the, the development of bombing and artillery and poisonous gas. Uh, time in the trenches wasn't a feature in say the South African war. Uh, POWs were really just a big feature of the World War II. Uh, and then there were changes in all these uh, other uh, differences and other, other variables, including uh, the different levels of support when they returned from the uh, conflict. So within the World War II cohort of um, 700 odd men, we uh, couldn't identify a difference in POWs. I think a larger uh, study would be required for that. Large difference between men in the Maori Battalion and all others, potentially reflecting the uh, background high, higher, you know, uh, well, lower lifespan for uh, Maori men at that time, but also, as I said, the Maori battalion uh, possibly sustained more um, uh, wounding and other things that would have affected uh, veterans' health. And, and a sort of somewhat bizarre finding is that if you're, it's a bit tautological, but if you're buried next to your spouse, you actually live another. Eight, uh, seven years, but actually <laughs> that that is reflecting probably the um, you know the benefit men get from having a spouse, which is quite well known in the literature. There's a, a big survival benefit for um, having a partner, and it, unfortunately, I don't think it actually works the opposite way. Just an example of a you know a key uh, leader in um, World War Two. He actually died from his war wounds. Uh, which actually had been uh, sustained in the previous war at, I think, uh, Gallipoli. So, yeah, even, you know, there was, despite um, high status males um, potentially having less injury, uh, sometimes they did. So just thinking of some of the limitations and, and strengths of uh, some of this work with the World War II study at sea, it is the first World War II life soon study for New Zealand. Um, uh, and there's no, um, I mean, we, in, we do plan in the future to do more, which, which ha will have be a bit more rigorous than the uh, cemetery type uh, work. Um, and yeah, it is just one large uh, cemetery, though the tighter cemetery does draw from a wide range of socioeconomic uh, groups. So it may, may not be entirely uh, non-representative. Um, and yeah, from that sample, we, we, it was too limited to really properly explore things like different types of, you know, uh, being in the Air Force or the uh, Navy or Army or uh, War Theatre or POW status. So in terms of further research needs, we think it's, there should be a properly funded large study of the lifespan impacts of World War II veterans. You know, there's still... Some of them are still alive in their 90s, but um, we need to know about this for understanding about um, uh, getting involved in future conflicts. And of course, there's you know, many dimensions you know, that can be studied. Uh, you can actually could explore the impact of wounds, uh, you know, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and, and those other, other aspects. And you can, get, you can get death certificates on all these men as well. So, um, uh, it's still $20 each, but you know, potentially there could be some way we could get a, um, a bulk purchase or uh, that, that they'd be provided for free for research. And we also need to understand what are the impacts on health of these other conflicts that New Zealand has been uh, involved in. Um, and of course, see how some of them, uh, there has been research by people like uh, Neil Pierce on um, Agent Orange and so on. Uh, which, which does you know, have some concerning uh, findings. So really just to sum up and uh, conclude here, so um, you know, New Zealand has uh, experienced these 
significant health impacts uh, in its uh, military personnel, and sometimes the high morbidity levels have been underappreciated. Uh, it seems like New Zealand's had excessive trust in British military leadership, creating big problems around, say, Gallipoli and you know, potentially uh, Crete and so on. Um, though there was some learning and New Zealand tried to get more control in subsequent law, uh, wars as opposed to just following uh, British command. Uh, and it seems like New Zealand's had this pattern of being focused on sending very high numbers of troops uh, to all these particular wars, often trying to outdo Australia, um, and uh, really in that process neglecting training and other uh, preparations. And some common features of these wars are uh, the troops having deficient equipment, poor food, crowded troop ships, and inadequate um, uh, medical services. So to conclude again on, on veteran lifespan, so uh, there were consistent gaps in lifespan between combat and non-combat personnel for, um, uh, amongst the veterans of World War I and World War II, but not so uh, in the South African War for some reason. Uh, and we need more studies, especially World War II uh, and subsequent wars, uh, where you know, veterans could still benefit from uh, improved services. Uh, but generally, it's important to understand when we send people to war, what it actually means. And, and from this research, there is a very long shadow of uh, health impacts that, that goes on for uh, many decades, perhaps um, uh, lifelong. So thanks for that and hope, hope you've got some questions. Okay, uh, when there's questions, there's one at the back there. Uh, we'll get a microphone to you. That was super interesting. Thank you, Nick. Oh, very interesting. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I have a question, um, and, and it may be slightly off topic, um, but um, this is the health impacts on the actual veterans. Um, is there any... Have you, is there any studies on um, health impacts on the public health in general? Like, you know, how mental health has got progressively worse. Could that be connected to, um, like, any declines in returning veterans and how family dynamics changed and, you know, that sort of impact on other people after they return home and... Is yeah, so like I haven't really uh, explored that much, but I know, uh, for example, with uh, World War I veterans, when they uh, returned, some of these case studies showed that uh, it had a big impact on their uh, partners who had to look after them, or if they were badly injured, their family business or family farm uh, you know, went bankrupt. Uh, and, and there were some reports of say, amongst suicides, amongst uh, family members, uh, both because they had lost uh, relatives in the war, but also dealing with uh, disabled veterans uh, back at home. And you know, there, was con there was concern about also the spread of sexually transmitted diseases back in New Zealand from returning veterans. So yeah, it's, there's a whole lot of uh, tragic uh, sequelae uh, meted out on families, whanau, and you know, in the community. And, the, and it is a cost for the community to pay for uh, the various um, uh, support as veterans, you know, some of them became alcoholics, for example, some of them went into TB uh, sanatorium to try and get their tuberculosis cured. So yeah, there's a lot of spillover things, but that's not an area I've particularly looked at. Thank you, Nick. That's very impressive and salutary work. <laughs> um, lots of questions, but I'll ask one about nurses. Have you, you know, the, both in the Boer First World and Second World War, there were New Zealand nurses who went with the men. Have, did you look at their health too? Uh, no, actually, numbers were quite small for the South African War, but yeah, they they definitely did increase in the subsequent wars. Um, but and some books have been written. Uh, for about New Zealand nurses in both world wars, but uh, I haven't particularly uh, looked at that. But, you know, because 
uh, particularly in World War II, there was a great increase in artillery. So even nurses working in field hospitals some way back from the front line, they would be killed when um, uh, the artillery uh, got them. And uh, there, was, there was a ship sunk in the Mediterranean with a lot of nurse, New Zealand nurses on board. Uh, so, you know, they had, they'd had definitely significant mortality. Yes. Yep. They had. Yes, definitely. Yep. Again, thank you. Who knows about this? Does Ron Mark, Minister of Veterans Affairs, know about this? Do any politicians care? Do any generals know about this? <laughs> Does the uh, peace movement know about it? Uh, I have presented this this material at uh, his, at various history conferences, uh, and you know, uh, just last month at a, a military history conference. So I was trying to convey you know the long shadow of uh, New Zealand's conflict, and we did send um, our various papers to uh, Ron Mark, but he hasn't replied. Uh, part of the problem in New Zealand is that the Veterans Affairs is actually within the Defence Department. Most countries separate them, but New Zealand, they're all, it's all integrated. And so uh, maybe that's why we don't have proper studies on uh, veteran health, because uh, it will cost the military if they have to pay more uh, pensions. So it's an unfortunate setup, probably. Okay. Uh, if there's no immediate, I guess there's one. Yep. Hi, that, that was really interesting. This is just a minor speculative point, in that it looks like you did uh, got your um, World War Two data from Titus Cemetery, and from that photo, like you got it from the war grave section of the cemetery. And there will, of course, have been a lot of servicemen who went on and they or the families chose not to define their lives by their service nature and they would have been buried in different parts of the cemetery. And um, so they would have, I guess, been part of your comparison population. And if those people were also included or separated out, you know, speculate on the effect this would have on your results? Uh, actually, the cemetery data I had was for all veterans, no matter where they were buried in the cemetery. Uh, so it's possible some of them, the cemetery authorities may not know and they were a, a veteran, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, and, and the, other, the other problem is that there's no data on the veterans who might have been cremated. So that might have created a, a, a bias there. But as far as I know, yeah, and the, the cemetery, uh, would would often allow the you know set aside a great a place for the spouse or another uh, relative next to the person. So that's why there was that data on uh, being next to a spouse. Okay. Um, <laughs> extension to that then. So um, because not all cemeteries did that. Um, um, I know. So. Um, in that case, if you separated it out, define their life by what, uh, participation in the war and define their life by participation in the Catholic community or the agnostic community or the Greek community, you know, all the other things, did you, would you have a difference in um, length of life then, the sub-analysis? Yes. I just don't have that, uh, that extra data, I think, on things like their religious affiliation or... Um, but I, I think there are definite problems with using symmetry data. There'll be, you know, I mean, it's the generalizability is limited. It was just our only data source. And, and we do hope uh, now that uh, the, the online file, military files are being digitalized for the World War II troops uh, that eventually, you know, we'll be able to uh, do a proper random sampling of the whole, uh, of, of the whole service. Do we have any online questions? Okay. One question. 
Okay, this might be need to be our last if we can be, be on time. Um, this is not really a proper question, Nick. It's sort of amusing out loud. But you know how sort of common wisdom about war is that the war leaders are always fighting the last war. So they learn from experience, but it's not really applicable <clears throat> because they're not in that war anymore. Uh, so I'm just sort of thinking about the virtues or otherwise of learning from experience because the next major world war, although such an event is unimaginable, uh, I'm just thinking of you know, how relevant some of our learning is here to a future war which, whose weapons are almost unimaginable and who, which, whose effects are going to be almost unimaginable. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking that you know, your, some of the implications of your discussion, which are great, um, are relevant to minor little conflagrations here and there, but not you know, World War IV, because as sure. we know, Einstein said that he didn't know what World War III would involve, what weapons, but World War IV would, would be fought by sticks and stones. Yes, uh, and I think in terms of relevance, it's more about, you know, most New Zealand military go overseas now for peacekeeping duties, uh, but there's, you know, there's still been problems with, you know, well, when they went to Afghanistan, they weren't uh, properly equipped again. So that idea of um, properly equipping people is, uh, is, is a problem. And definitely, it, sometimes they need two wars before they have to learn the lessons. For example, uh, the, the walking up, the frontal assault that was disastrous in the South African war, they were still doing it through most of World War I. So uh, the, the learning process is, seems extremely slow and tortuous. And New Zealand still, you know, for those three wars, it was being, it wasn't learning that you had to uh, get out of British command where you'd just be dragged into some disastrous conflict. So it was, it was very slow. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for questions. And uh, if you could join me uh, again, I'd congratulate Nick. Thank you.